Testing? Okay. So good morning, everybody. This is uh, What's New in Java FX8. I'm uh, Jim Weaver, and also uh, my colleagues uh, Michael Hoffer and Stephen Chin will be uh, presenting on some, uh, some topics here. And I'm a Java Technology Ambassador at Oracle Corporation. And here's uh, my Twitter handle is JavaFExpert, and you can always get a hold of me at james.weaver at oracle.com. Um, what I'd like to do is go through just kind of a quick bootstrap on what JavaFX is and how you can begin developing with it uh, to, to create an, a user interface and also help you understand a little bit about um, uh, the scene builder, which is a uh, what you see is what you get tool for putting together user interfaces. And then I'm going to talk about some of the new features in JDK 8 that, that are useful in JavaFX 8, as well as talking about some JavaFX 8 features new to JavaFX 8. And then um, Michael Hoffer is going to show you a, a JavaFX application that he just put in the Mac App Store and uh, that leverages a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about. And then Stephen Chin is going to show you um, JavaFX 8 concepts running on a Raspberry Pi. As you know, we're um, getting more and more into the embedded space and the Internet of Things space, and so JavaFX is doing the same thing, and so Stephen Chin will be talking about that. This is our standard Oracle disclaimer. Um, and so what is JavaFX? JavaFX is, is just an API that comes with Java. So if you have Java 7 or Java 8, you've got JavaFX. It's, it's, a, it's a user interface API. And it is the successor to Java Swing. There's not much new development happening at all with Swing. JavaFX is the, the UI of choice moving forward for rich client applications. And it's not the old JavaFX script language. So to get JavaFX, if you've got 7 or 8, you've got JavaFX. And then to develop with JavaFX, just use your favorite IDE. You could use IntelliJ IDEA or Eclipse or NetBeans or JDeveloper, for example. Um, here's a resource that I'd like to point you to, and it's, um, it's the JavaFXCommunity.com site. Um, a lot of the developers in the very vibrant JavaFX community blog there, and then we aggregate their blogs, and there's news and lots of resources and things that you can see at that site. So uh, myself and a, a gentleman by the name of Garrett Grunwald are the... Uh, the co-leads for the JavaFX community site. Also, there are lots of resources, lots of books out there on JavaFX. Um, myself and a, and a couple colleagues, well, Stephen Chin and Johan Voss, who's one of the conference organizers, um, have written a book called Pro JavaFX 2. And also, Johan is carrying that forward as the lead author on Pro JavaFX 8. So that'll be, you know, you can look for that. Also, another good site that you could go to is fxexperience.com, and that's one that the JavaFX engineers at Oracle maintain. So as they have new and exciting things that are, that are coming or they, even, or they want input from the community, a lot of times they'll do a blog post there. So I'd like to go very quickly through how you would create a user interface in JavaFX. Uh, programmatically. You can use Scene Builder, which is a what you see is what you get, drag and drop kind of environment. But first I'm going to show you how you would do it programmatically in, in just using NetBeans and, and writing code by hand. So first of all, you select in NetBeans, you select uh, uh, that you want a JavaFX application, um, and you do that in New Project. And then uh, you in the new application, new JavaFX application dialog, you give you give your project a name. We're going to call ours Metronome Transition. And what we're going to build actually is this application here, where it's a metronome and it demonstrates some animation principles, where we're taking a ball and kind of bouncing it back and forth every second. And as we as we press these buttons, then notice that the buttons uh, change state. They go from disabled to enabled, and also the animation pauses or resumes or stops. 
So I'm going to go through in this, in this example as we build this application, I'm going to go through all the concepts that make those things possible. So first of all, whenever you create a JavaFX application, you always extend the application class. And here we're doing that. And then uh, the JavaFX has a runtime. So the runtime then, after it instantiates the class and gets everything set up, it then calls the start method that you supply. So you override the application start method. That's part of the uh, life cycle of a JavaFX application. And then here, we're going to make an instance of a circle because that, that ball is what's going to go back and forth. So here, we're just using a constructor and using the circle class and giving it some parameters. 100, we're going to make it appear at 100x, 50y, give it a radius of 4, and a blue color. And, um, and then we're going to go ahead and create some buttons. So here we're creating a new button, and then we're associating an event handler with that. Now here we're using anonymous inner classes to create the event handler. But later I'm going to show you how to use lambdas to simplify this code. But here what we're doing is uh, we're setting on action here and making a, an event handler. And when the, actu when the actual event happens, then uh, we're going to play the animation from start. There's this animation that it's, a, it's a, um, a translate transition that we'll see in a second that causes that animation to happen. It causes the, the circle to translate from one xy coordinate to another xy coordinate. By the same token, here's a pause button. That pause button then has a, an event handler as well. So um, the next thing we do is we'll lay out those buttons in an H box, a horizontal box. So that's, that's um, this horizontal box down here where our buttons are. So we create a new H box. The 10 is actually the number of pixels that we want between the things that are contained in that horizontal box. And then we're going to place it at a certain X and Y location. And then we're going to add to the horizontal box some children. Those children are the four buttons. And those, that's what causes those buttons to be laid out in the H box. And then we're going to create the scene. Everything in JavaFX is in what's called a scene graph. So you have a scene that then contains a hierarchical set of nodes in the scene graph. So everything in JavaFX is a node, um, from buttons to shapes to uh, full-blown uh, web uh, browsers that are embedded in the scene called a web view to media players. Everything is a, is a node. And then you have layouts. That's why it's a hierarchical kind of thing, because you have containers that can contain other nodes. So here, in our scene, we've got a group, which is a very simple container. And in the group, we're going to put this circle, and we'll put the buttons container. And again, the buttons container contains these buttons. So that's how we're creating and populating the scene graph. By the way, if you have any questions as we go along, please raise your hand. I'd be glad to, to answer them as we go along. Some, if I, if I think that it's great, to go ahead and take the time to answer it now. I'll do that. And uh, otherwise, I might say, well, we're going to cover that in a little bit, and so that's fine. Um, or it may be something that I think is uh, we should take offline and maybe talk about outside. So, um, but please do raise your hand and, and let me know if you have a question. I think there might be mics that we can. Uh, there's mics up there. Uh, are they, is there a mic stand? OK, there's a mic stand, so just go to the mic and uh, ask your question. So now. We want to animate the circle. So we're going to use this translate transition, which is a class that, um, that animates and, and translates um, a node from one xy coordinate, actually one xyz coordinate if you're talking about 3D, to another. So here, we're creating a new instance of it and then passing in a new duration of 1,000 milliseconds. So that means that every second, this translate transition is going to, uh, to complete. And then the, th the node that's going to get translated 
in an animated fashion is that circle. So we'll go ahead and use the, the member functions of this, like set from x, set to x, those are positioned at zero, and then it says go ahead and translate it to 200 pixels on the x-axis. The interpolation is going to be linear. The interpolation uh, is how do you want, as this timeline uh, goes across, as the ball goes across, how do you want it to be interpolated? Do you want it to be very smooth in a linear fashion? Do you want it to start out slowly and then end up slowly? Um, do you want it to be some kind of custom speeds? Uh, that's interpolation. Where do you want that ball to appear at a given uh, point in time between uh, zero and one seconds? And so our interpolation is going to be linear. Also, we want to be able to make the thing go back and forth. So automatically, when you're done with the, with the translate, then go ahead and reverse and go from 200 to zero. And then the cycle count is indefinite, so it's going to do it until we stop it. So um, that, what I've just showed you, explains all of the behavior of, uh, of the application here, except for there's one thing that I haven't shown you. There's one piece of behavior that I haven't shown you. So can somebody raise their hand and tell me what piece of behavior I haven't explained? Yes. Right. So. Uh, my colleague just said the state of the buttons. I have not explained why the buttons are disabled and enabled when I press them. And so that is uh, because of the magic of binding in JavaFX. So here what we're doing, for example, is we're setting the, we're binding actually, the disable property of the start button to the, um, the status of the animation. So if the status of the animation is not equal to stopped, then we're going to be disabled. Our start button is going to be disabled. So here in the case that it's running, our start button is disabled. But as soon as we pause it here, um, then it's going to go ahead and and be enabled. And so you just set that up once with binding and because of the properties and the binding um, capabilities of JavaFX, it just automatically keeps your client-side model in sync with your UI. So uh, it's a very powerful feature that you can leverage with JavaFX. So then finally we go ahead and set up the stage and uh, so here we're setting the scene to the stage, and then we're giving the stage a title, and then we're showing the stage. So that's, that's it for kind of the application architecture for JavaFX. Very easy to create one, and if you use NetBeans or some other IDEs, there's usually a default project that you can create and then just change. Now there's something called Scene Builder. Some people and some projects may be better suited to being able to drag and drop uh, user interface components rather than, um, rather than coding them by hand. And so there's something called Scene Builder. And this is what Scene Builder looks like. You've got components over here, you've got property sheets over here, and you're dragging and dropping things to the user interface. So uh, Scene Builder is just a layout tool for JavaFX and behind the scenes, there's something called FXML. So it's an FXML editor. Um, it saves and, and loads FXML, and that at runtime is what gets loaded in and, and expresses the user interface. So it's a visual editor for FXML. And so FXML then is this XML-based language the, that expresses the user interface. And it is designed to be toolable. One of those tools is Scene Builder. So that may be an option that you want to take. Um, so you can download Scene Builder from Oracle. Also, there is a Scene Builder 2.0 preview available with enhanced features and uh, just an updated look that you might take a look at. 
So now, uh, after that brief introduction to JavaFX, what I'd like to do is switch over and talk about some new features in JDK 8 that are leveraged in JavaFX and that you can leverage when you develop JavaFX application. Uh, there's the Nashorn JavaScript engine. It's a JavaScript engine that, that runs on the JVM, so it's real fast. There's the date and time API. It's uh, JSR 310. It's the Stephen Colburn uh, Yoda time uh, project kind of next generation that got rolled into JDK 8. Just a really great date time API. And there's also lots of things around lambdas, lambdas expressions themselves, and then also the bulk data collections um, with Lambda um, and a lot of the, the streaming uh, capabilities and, and uh, really the ability to uh, leverage in an easy way um, uh, you know, multiple cores in, in your uh, computer. So I wanted to briefly talk about what Lambda expressions are and actually uh, my colleagues then are going to uh, talk about bits and pieces of Lambdas that that I don't cover here, but it's essentially um, a function that can have parameters. It's an anonymous function. It can have parameters, and then it, uh, it can have either expression or a block of code, but it, think of it as um, an anonymous function. So the way you can tell a lambda is the thin arrow here, and here over on the left is, in this case, is optional parameter, and then here is what we're going to do. So that in this case, we're going to play that animation from start. So um, as far as you know, what a lambda is, um, a lambda is, uh, is you know, something that an anonymous function that takes um, uh, parameters and then has a body or maybe just one expression. But um, any place that you have an anonymous inner class or a functional interface, um, then you can go ahead and use a lambda in place of that. So a functional interface is some interface that has exactly one abstract function, and one abstract method. So in this case, the, um, the event handler has one abstract method called handle. So that's a prime candidate then for turning that into a lambda. So um, in this case, the, the event handler here, that is the type of lambda that's being passed into this on action method. And then the compiler knows that. It knows what to expect into the on action method, so it knows that the type of lambda expression is this event handler. Um, and then also, it knows that the type of uh, uh, parameter that's going to be passed into the uh, into the lambda expression here is an action event, so it knows all that. So this is a form of of lambda expressions that we could use, where we 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 go ahead and spell out the type. We use these parentheses. We use the thin arrow. Put the curly braces around there, and and that's just fine. But we can simplify that because the compiler knows what type of of, um, of uh, parameter is going to be passed. And so we don't have to say action event. We can just say E. And then we can simplify it even further because if you have only one parameter and you don't have to type it, then you can lose the parentheses here. So we don't need those parentheses. And then because there's only one thing that we're doing in that block, we can go ahead and remove the curly braces and so we can use this form. And so that simplifies especially when you think in terms of, of replacing a, a nasty uh, anonymous inner class, it really simplifies things. So, um, so here are just a couple of examples that I'd like to point out then of anonymous, or of, uh, of um, lambda expressions. Here we're going to add an invalidation listener. And um, so here we've got an add listener. And this takes an invalidation listener here takes a, a type of a validation listener. And the thing that the actual um, parameter that gets passed to an invalidation listener is um, an observable. And so um, here when we add the listener, 
we're going to get passed in an observable, and then we're going to print it out. So if then we take this simple string property and we set it to lo hello, then it's going to print hello because it will have the observable passed in here automatically, and then we'll go ahead and do the print run and print out the, the value of that, that simple string property. And the same thing with ring bearer. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is, is we're creating a simple string property. We're calling add listener and then passing in this lambda expression. And then when the property changes, it gets passed in and we print something out. Any questions on that at all? Okay. Okay, and then by the same token, now we're going to uh, do a change listener. A change listener um, has one abstract method. It's an interface. It has one abstract method that takes three arguments. And so here we're going to add a listener to that same simple string property with the observable property and then the old and the new, the observable value and then the old and the new, and then... Um, and then we'll print that out. So when we set this to Gandalf the white, then it's going to say, well, it was Gandalf the gray, but now is Gandalf the white. So it takes the, because it's passed in the old value and the new value, then uh, we can print out both here. And, and uh, we're adding to the listener that lambda that represents the changed listener. Okay. So lambdas really clean up your code. So here is how you would create a table column for a table view. And then this is what it looks like with lambda expressions. So it's much cleaner, much easier to use. So I would um, definitely uh, suggest that you begin moving over to lambdas using those and, and uh, seeing what kind of benefits it has in terms of not only uh, less code, but also power when it comes to uh, really leveraging multiple cores. So there's another uh, kind of related concept to lambdas called method references. So if in a lambda expression all you're going to do is call a method or maybe call a constructor, then you can use something called a method reference to save a little bit of um, a little bit of code and make things a little bit clearer. For example, here's an application where we've got this button, and when you press the button, the action event triggers, and then we have a lambda that calls this guess method. So, and this is, we can do this, right? We're going to be passed in the event, and then we're going to call the, mess, the guess method, and we're going to pass that same event into the guess method. And then we're going to say, you love Lambda. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and demonstrate that here. So guess what I'm thinking? You love Lambda, all right? That's the, that's the behavior. But instead of doing that, what we could do is use a method reference. So here, in the set on action, instead of having that Lambda expression and then calling this method in using the lambda syntax, we can use a method reference, which is always some class or instance, colon, colon, kind of like C++, right? Colon, colon, and then some method name. So here, we're saying in, the, in this um, object, go ahead and call the guess method, and the compiler knows that what was passed to this lambda expression was an event object. So it's going to go ahead and call the guess method with the event object. So it's just a, an easier way to kind of think about this, and you don't have to repass, uh, consciously repass the event. You just go ahead and, and use the method reference. So there's four different types of method references you can use. Um, the one that we just used was, was this one, this containing object. But you could also, um, if you're, if within a lambda expression, all you're going to do is call uh, a static method, then you could just say the containing some class name and then a static method. Or you could say a containing type and the method name. For example, here's uh, an example of this. Um, if you had a file filter 
and you wanted to um, associate a lambda expression with that, f thin arrow, f can read. So f gets, a file gets passed in and then returns whether it can be read or not. So rather than do this, then you could just give it a type here and then can read. And that would be this thing, the containing type and method name. And then it would go ahead and take the f and then call and then, you know, which is a, uh, an instance of a file object and would call the can read method on that. So th uh, that's another uh, form of these, um, of these method references. And the final form is reference to a constructor. So if, if I wanted to, in a lambda expression, all I'm going to do is construct a new object, then I could say some class name new, and then it would take the lambda parameter and then use that in the constructor for the new object of this class name, okay? So it's just a convenience thing, makes things more straightforward, tends to make things more testable, and uh, it's, a, it's a good thing, and it makes you think you're a C++ programmer. But uh, questions on, on method references? Okay. Um, so if you want more information on um, you know, kind of this brief introduction to lambdas I just gave you. I have a blog post at javafexpert.com. It's called Mary Had a Little Lambda, and it kind of goes through that first lambda example and how to simplify that. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is pro Project Nashorn, and that's, as I mentioned, that's a JavaScript engine uh, that runs on top of the JVM, and it's just a, a lot faster than what we used to have, which was Rhino. And um, so it has a lot of great support for JavaFX. So how you use Nashorn is you, you use JavaScript, and then it runs, again, on top of the uh, JVM. So here we're just creating, this, these are like includes, but we're creating uh, instances of objects here, or types of objects. And then here we are um, associating, or we're setting different attributes of those objects and under the covers it's calling the sets and the gets, uh, setters and getters. So it's pretty straightforward here. So here we're just you know, creating a new rectangle and then we're, we're setting some attributes. Um, we're putting them in a stack pane, which is a container. And then we're creating a rotate transition. A rotate transition is just like the translate transition, only over time it rotates rather than be, uh, translating. And so, you know, we have our auto-reverse to true, we have our rotation transition uh, in, indefinite for our cycle count, and we're playing it. So this time, to, to go ahead and invoke it, if you can see that, yeah, um, you just say JJS, which is the command line version to uh, invoke Nashorn, and then you say dash FX, and that knows, that, that puts all the FX runtime in there for you, and then we'll give it the name of the JavaScript. So here we'll go ahead and execute that. And then that pulls out a window that then is running that JavaScript with the JavaFX libraries. Okay? So that's Project Nashorn, very powerful concept. <coughs> So Nashorn um, is used by FXML. Um, uh, so it, under the covers, um, it leverages uh, all the goodness of, of Nashorn. So when you use Scene Builder um, and FXML, you're, you're you know, leveraging Nashorn as well. So now I'd like to kind of switch gears to talk about some JavaFX features um, that are uh, new to JDK 8. So there are several features um, from, you know, a new look, a new style, um, some enhancements to some core things like collections and bindings and tasks and services, some UI-based improvements, a couple of new controls, uh, some CSS-related things, some web view enhancements, some 3D um, that's that's a, a, a new thing that, that is in JavaFX 8, very powerful thing for uh, new user interfaces. And also, multi-touch, which first appeared in 7, but has been enhanced for 8, 
Java FX 3D and multi-touch kind of go hand in hand um, because especially, you know, I'm, I'm demonstrating off of a, a Windows 8 tablet and so a lot of the things that I'm going to be showing you with 3D, I'm going to be manipulating 3D objects with multi-touch. And so those things kind of go hand in hand and also be discussing um, embedded support. So first of all, uh, Modena. Uh, Modena is a new theme for JDK uh, JavaFX 8 and it is uh, JavaFX 8 and it is um, it's uh, by default the theme that's selected and there's a utility if you download uh, JavaFX 8 um, samples there's something called Modena and it's an application that you can see all of the styles you know this you can see like what all the buttons look like and what all the different uh, checkboxes and and um, you know UI components look like and also one really nice thing about Modena as well as Caspian is you it, uh, Jasper Potts the the lead architect for the the graphics behind this Modena is um, has made it so that um, you can very easily select you know background colors and base colors things like that and then it makes decisions for you that um, you know that uh, will suggest different uh, colors for controls so I might want to change from a transparent background for example I might want to change to a gray background and then it then suggests um, button states uh, button colors, things like that in that particular style. So it's very powerful um, style and it's a very modern looking style. So that's that's one of the things that's uh, new to uh, JavaFX 8. JavaFX 8. Um, you can change back to Caspian if you want to by just setting the user agent style sheet or you could define your own styles and then use set user agent style sheet to your own style. Um, even things like charts and and the way that components are contained by other components is managed by the way by Modena. So certain of the decorations and things and some components are removed or altered so that it makes it very easy for you to put different components inside of other components. So now, uh, getting away from the UI aspects, we can go into the base, kind of the core module in, in core modules in JavaFX, and, and discuss some of the enhanced features in JDK in JavaFX 8. So, as we know, uh, Java 8 has Lambda, and it, um, it it has lots of things that have to do with collections, and you know the bulk collections API. Well, JavaFX 8. Um, has a lot of those things too with um, kind of leverages what's in JDK 8 to um, to kind of enhance the power of the, the, that is already in the observable lists and collections that we already have in, J, in JavaFX 8. So we have something called um, you know observable uh, array, we have a new thing called a filtered list and a sorted list which leverages that power of JDK 8, specifically something called default methods, um, virtu you know, extension methods. And Stephen Chin is going to talk more about the extension methods, uh, which is basically a way to, um, you know, to extend what's already in an interface. It's kind of a magic way to be able to do that that is now in JDK 8. So as an example, to use the new filtered list, here I want to create a filtered list. Um, I, I have an observable list in JavaFX and here I'm going to uh, create one of those. I'm going to put four strings in that observable list. And then I want to filter that. So I'm going to say filtered list starts with A equals strings dot filtered and then pass in a lambda. And the lambda then is going to, um, in, in the body, is going to uh, only uh, return true when it starts with A. And so that's, that's how easy it is to work with a filtered list with, the, um, with an, uh, an observable list. And so when we print that, it would only print the ones that begin with A. So here's a practical example with, of that with a table view. So here's a, a table view. So here's a table view. And maybe I want to uh, only show 
things that start with A. So I'll go ahead and type A, and now that, um, that only shows the A's, and I'm, maybe I'm going to show things that only start with AL. So as I'm typing, it's automatically narrowing the list. So the code behind that, so the code behind that, here I've got a comparator, and then um, you know a lambda expression which takes object one and object two, and then we're comparing. And then here on the filtered list, um, we're sorting it, but then we're, we're not filtering anything out. When this gets passed, it's always going to return true, and then we create our filtered view. But when we type, when, when the key's released, uh, we're setting the predicate, and then that predicate is then um, filtering um, out and anything, only allowing to pass through anything that starts with the string that's been typed in so far. So just a, a, in a few lines of code, a way to be able to uh, leverage the power of lambda expressions and also these filtered lists to narrow down what is showing in a table view. Okay? So then um, we have something called an observable array. Now observable arrays were added because of JavaFX 3D. Needed a really quick way to be able to represent all of the faces and the points and different things in, in uh, in, in 3D meshes, in 3D objects. And so there was something called an observable array created, but they're just like observable lists, only they take, um, they, they have collection, or they, they are uh, floats and ints and things like that. And so we just have some basic methods here. Here we're creating a, a collection. Here we're ensuring the capacity, kind of like, you know, so that we can optimize the thing as it grows. Here we're adding some floats getting a specific value, setting a value, and, uh, and printlin. Uh, and so toString is implemented in this. And so it's just wanted to make you aware now we have observable arrays that are, again, because of 3D, but you can use them a as you want to then for your collections that takes primitives. So in these observable arrays, here's just a particular use case. Maybe you want to make a copy of one. And so we'll just uh, um, we'll say copy to uh, this buffer of floats. Um, and here we can um, uh, populate the copy here. So we're copying some floats to an array, to an observable array. Um, then we have some uh, binding enhancements. And so binding, as I showed you with the metronome transition, is a very powerful feature that keeps the UI uh, in sync with your client-side model. And so there are a lot of enhancements to that. Um, for example, if you wanted to synchronize two observable lists, you could do that very easily um, by using bind content uh, of, of the two observable lists, and that would keep them in sync. Here, if I have an observable list that has these four elements in it, and then I add um, a copy or add something to that the the source list and I printed out the copy that copy would show in the target list so a lot of binding um, enhancements there then we have some task and service enhancements tasks and services are how in Java FX you do um, you know multitasking things so you can create tasks um, you can monitor their state you can create services which are typically just uh, one or more tasks, a service that, that runs and is responsible for uh, making sure that tasks get done. So one of the things that was enhanced in, in J JavaFX 8 is the ability to update the, t the value of the task as it's running. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate here. Um, I'm going to activate the mind reading algorithm and notice that it says U and then three seconds later R getting sleepy, right? So, um, so if I look at the code behind that, you know, we have this new task, and the task has a call method. Um, when the call method gets called, you know, we have uh, four strings here, you are getting sleepy, and then we're, you know, concatenating those together, we're building those together. But notice, we're going through a loop here, and then we're appending each string 
to the next, to the, the total string, and then we're sleeping for three seconds so that we can see the effect of, of what's happening. So in there, we're, we're calling update value, which updates the value of the task. And then in the UI, we're, we're uh, binding the, uh, the user interface, the label I believe it is, uh, to the value of the task. And so as this value gets updated while the task is running, then we're updating the UI. And so that's, that explains the behavior. So then, that, so that's an enhancements in the task API. And then we have something called uh, scheduled service. And that is, you have the ability then, it's, it's, uh, it's a specialization of service where you can uh, schedule a service, but also there are different things, um, methods in there that you can override to give you specific behavior for things like if there are failures, you know, do you restart? Um, the backoff strategy, as I, as I, um, uh, as there are failures, how do I back off? Do I back off kind of in a logarithmic sense so that I'm, um, I'm uh, trying more often, but then as I'm not able to do something, start a task, complete a task, whatever, then I wait more and more time. So those are some of the things that are available to you in scheduled services. So then there's a lot of things that have to do with graphics. Uh, specifically, there's a use case for a kiosk, a, a full screen kind of UK, use case. And the main one is kiosk, but there are other reasons why you might want to only present something full screen to the user. And so um, the ability then to um, not let the user get out of full screen, or at least tell them how to get out of full screen, is very, um, is very useful. So here's a, a case where, let's make sure I can find it here real, quo, uh, real quick here. So here's a case where we're in full screen, and then you know I, the user can use it, but then if I hit Control X or I touch this rectangle, then it gets, or I touch this rectangle, then it gets out of full screen. So here's the code behind that. I can set a full screen exit key combination. In this case, Control X, and that way only Control X will get you out in terms of the keystrokes. And then also I can give a hint. I can say, you know, click, at, click control X or touch the rectangle to get out. And so that's why we saw that on the, on the example. And then here we're just creating a, a rectangle and then we're going to set full screen to false when they hit the rectangle. So we're giving them two ways to get out and then we've also told them what those two ways are. And then after you've done all that, then you go ahead and set full screen to true. And then if you want them, if you want to pre uh, prevent them altogether from getting out, um, like so that a keystroke won't get them out, what you can say is key combination no match. And that way they won't be able to leave full screen. But then typically you want to allow them a back door to be able to get out. So here, if they know to click the rectangle, then it will get them out. So that's... Um, that's some things having to do with full screen. Then there's something called unified stage style, and that's kind of a new style that's coming to Windows and then Mac and maybe Ubuntu. I'm not sure about Ubuntu, but uh, where you, in the, the title of the stage, you have more um, you know, components and things like that. And so now JavaFX has that ability to, in the, in the header, um, in the, kind of in the title of your window, be able to create a scene graph and then put it in the header. So that's, this is just an example of that. So here we're creating an instance of some uh, UI object. In this case, it's just a simple HTML editor. And then we're creating the new scene and then we're passing in that, that node. It could be a very complex node or or just you know one node like we've got here, 
and then um, we're emitting the stage style to stage style dot unified and then showing the stage. And here we're just doing some things to remove some of the, um, uh, the styling from the toolbars. So then um, in, prior to JavaFX 8, we were able to integrate Swing and JavaFX, and that's a an very important thing to be able to do because uh, since JavaFX is the successor to Swing, I uh, need a good migration path. So there are lots of Swing applications out there, client applications that uh, the people want to be able to migrate to JavaFX, but perhaps they don't want to write it completely from scratch. You'd like to somehow migrate it. So prior to JDK 8, we had the ability to um, embed JavaFX controls into uh, Swing applications. Now, there's another strategy that you can add to your toolbox, and that is to embed um, Swing into JavaFX applications. So that's, that's something called Swing Node here. Um, so here we have, um, I said that backwards. Did I say that backwards, Michael? Were you even listening? Were you listening? Yes. Okay. Did I say it backwards? No. Okay, good. Okay, it's good. Okay, Mike says it's fine. Okay, so anyway, um, so we, we have a J button here. We're going to create a J button, and then we're going to add an action listener. A J button, of course, is a swing button. And then... Um, we're going to, when we hit the J button, then we're going to set the text of a, of a label, of a JavaFX label, to, um, to some value. And so here we have a swing node, and then we're going to set the, that swing node, um, the contents of it, to a JavaFX button. So we're putting the JavaFX button into the swing node. And so here, notice we're having to say run later. And that is because, you know, there's two different threads going on between um, the JavaFX and Swing. There is a mode that you can use, and it's kind of experimental right now um, because JDK 8 is still in, um, in early access. But it's where the EDT is the same as the, um, the FX thread. And so if you start up the virtual machine with, with uh, JavaFX embed dot single dot or single thread equals true, then you don't have to do the run later. Uh, again, it's something that is, um, they're just kind of working on. It's not production ready, but it's, um, it, you avoid this having to kind of cross over the barrier both ways by doing the run later because it's in two different threads. So that's, that's coming, yes. Yes. Will Java FX eight provide the capability to uh, embed Java FX into a native window? Okay, so when you say native window, um, are, you, are you saying... Um, uh, SWT kind of thing? Or? Okay. Like, so you have, I, I don't know, Stephen, do you want to, do you, do you understand the question? Would you want to respond to that at all? Okay. But um, I'll find the answer for you, either before the session's over or afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we also have rich text, um, where uh, we can have nodes called text flow, where we can put any kind of nodes actually in there and then flow them like, um, like uh, a text node. So here's an example. Of rich, here's some examples of rich text, where you have rich text that kind of flows, and uh, we've got different fonts, different styles, 
different orientations, and then we have even different things like nodes put in there. And then here's just an example, hello world, where we've got um, rich text. We've got uh, in the same text flow, we've got one text object and then another text object. And so here's the code behind that. Here we're creating a text object. We're setting the fonts, the strokes, the widths, the fills, um, images, things like that. And then we're doing the same thing with world. And then we're creating a new text flow object that then has both hello and world in that. And again, you could have things that aren't even text nodes in there. And, um, and then they would just flow. And so those, you can do very powerful, uh, rich text kind of things with them. Also, there's a printing API in, J in JavaFX 8 to where you can either print the scene graph that, that the user is looking at, or you can construct a scene graph that's only for, um, for sending to the printer. And then here's the print. Uh, here's an example of using the print API. So we're print, you know, creating a print page layout, we're creating a printer job, doing some settings, and then uh, we're going to do the print page, and then if it's a success, then we're going to end the job. So we're, we're creating the, the print page, we are sending it to the printer, and then we're ending the print, uh, ending the print job if it was a success. Um, another thing with, with JD, uh, JavaFX 8 is this public API for CSS. And there are a number of reasons why we wanted to do that, but one is for, um, uh, for Scene Builder. It required that. But another thing is you can define your own CSS and then use it in applications, or other people can use the CSS that you defined. And so you can create your own custom CSS styles. Um, also, there are some WebView enhancements to WebView now um, supports uh, web sockets and web workers. So the web view is an embedded browser that you can put anywhere, and as many as you want actually, into your JavaFX applications, and it's a fully functioning web browser, you know, uh, HTML5, JavaScript, all that kind of thing. And then if you're doing uh, web sockets or web workers, then your web view can participate in that as well. And then, finally, we have some controls. We have the date picker, uh, finally. And it works with the java.time API, which is the, the new um, uh, JSR 310 that I was just talking about. And these are some of the things that are in the date picker. Uh, you have uh, your, kind of looks like a combo box, but you've got your date field and your icon. And then you have a calendar and then days of the week and current day and that type of thing. And then um, this is how you would use it. Uh, you created a new instance of a date picker and then you could set on action when they actually choose a date. Then you could set the value or get the value of the date picker and then store it in a local date. Well, local date is one of the, the classes in this new date time API. And so then you could print out the date selected, for example. And so that's just another view of the date picker. There's a, uh, on javafexpert.com, which again is my blog, there's a blog post and video that's kind of a primer on, um, on date picker and then talks about some of the related concepts like JSR 310, the date time API, and uh, a little bit about lambdas and using that being 7.4. So it's a very short video that kind of um, get you up to speed on those kinds of things. Also, there's a tree table view. There's a table view in JavaFX and a, and a tree view in JavaFX. And what this does is it combines both into one view so that you can have a hierarchical tree that then each node in the tree has multiple columns. So it, ex it kind of blends both. And it's a very useful thing when you, you want to have kind of nested data that each has uh, several columns. Um, so then I'd like to turn my attention toward a couple of related technologies that I talked about. One is JavaFX 3D, and the other is multi-touch. So I'm going to go through first some multi-touch things um, and um, 
like for example, you have touch gestures like swipe and scroll, rotate and zoom. There's, uh, you have touch events and touch points. When I touch the, the tablet, um, it's creating touch events and each touch event has one or more touch points. And there are some other things that, that make uh, multi-touch programming a lot easier, like there's a, pa a pagination control and uh, there's some tips on accommodating the fact that your fingers are wider than the mouse cursor. So um, first of all, uh, touch gestures. There are four kinds of touch gestures. There's rotate event, scroll, swipe, and zoom. And so I'll go ahead and and so I'll go ahead and um, demonstrate swipe. If I swipe this chalkboard here, notice it's um, swiping and, and animating over to the left, right, up, down, but I'm just doing a swipe gesture to make that happen. So if I look at the code behind, so if I look at the code behind that, um, here, first of all, I'm creating a translate transition, and that's simply animating it. When I do the swipe, it causes the, the node to animate over in the direction that I'm swiping. But then here is where we're capturing the swipe event, the, the swipe gesture. So it's kind of a higher level event um, that is created when the, when the, uh, when the um, you know, the touch, the hardware, the hardware and software that is, is uh, monitoring your touching, when it, def uh, when it um, determines that what you did was a swipe, either up, down, left, or right, then it will go ahead and call this uh, uh, method, set on swipe right, for example, passing in an event, um, or a lambda actually, but then that gets an event here, and then here we're uh, checking to see where that node is, and then we're going to do the translate transition based upon where the node was. So if I'm able to swipe right, then it would go ahead and do the translate transition. So the same thing with swipe left and down and up. So then there's also something called a scroll gesture where when I drag my when I drag my finger anywhere around here it's scrolling and so scrolling and so what happens there is as I'm dragging it as I first touch it and begin to drag it I get an initial event kind of a start scroll kind of event and then as I scroll, then it continuously reports that I'm scrolling. So, um, and the events are either pixel-based or if I had text maybe that I'm horizontally scrolling, uh, sorry, vertically scrolling, I might want to make that text-based, you know, the, the, the height of a particular text so that I'm scrolling, um, you know, one line of text at a time. In this case, I'm just doing pixels. Also, something called inertia is supported, so that if I if I f scrolled and then maybe uh, mo removed my finger, and if an, if I decided that I wanted inertia to be into play, then it would continue to report events even after I've even after I've lifted my finger, based upon the velocity of the scroll, and so in this case. I didn't choose to do that. As soon as I lift my finger, it stops. But if, I, if, I, um, if I'm not checking for inertia and I'm just accepting any events, then those events would continue to be reported and would use some type of a, you know, some type of a physics kind of algorithm to, to slow down um, to where it would stop. So here's the code behind that. When I start the scroll, then I'm going to simply um, record the current X and Y position based upon the layout X and layout Y position of that node. And then as the events are continuously reported, if, if I don't care about inertia, then I'm setting the layout of that node to the current position that we, that we recorded when we started the scroll and adding that to the total delta of the x change, of the x. So um, since I started the scroll, 
the total amount of pixels that it got changed on the x-axis is added to the current position, and that's why it tracks on both on the x-axis and on the y-axis as I'm scrolling. Okay? Any questions there? Okay? So now the next gesture, I shouldn't have closed that because I'm going to use it again. Give me one second. Okay. So my next one is the rotate gesture. And that's when the user uh, rotates two fingers around each other. And those, are, um, those have kind of a start event as well as continuously reporting as we're doing them. So. So here we go. Here's the rotate. So here's the code behind that. Uh, we've got an image view, that's that chalkboard. And then we've got a rotation started. And then what we're doing when the rotation starts is we're simply um, recording the current rotation value of the node. And we're storing that in current rotation angle. And then, as they're continuously reported, we, um, we set the rotate of the total angle that it was rotated plus the current rotated angle, okay? So it's fairly straightforward. And then we have a zoom gesture, and that's where we separate or close our fingers together. And it's the same kind of thing. When the zoom starts, we get the current zoom factor by getting the scale x, the, the current scale x um, value. And then on zoom, we take the total zoom factor that's happened since, since the zoom first started, and we multiply that by the current zoom factor that, that was in play when it started. And so that keeps that in sync. That's why, that's why it zooms with us here. And the same example is both, you know, zooming, rotating, and scrolling. Okay? So then we have something called touch events and touch points. What I've shown you so far with the swipe and zoom and scroll and rotate are gestures that are kind of higher level events. But if I want to be able to tell just when something was touched and where the touch points were, and maybe I want to do my own thing when when I sense those touch points and touch events, then I can go down one level and say, okay, I want to manipulate the touch events and touch points. So here's a very simple example where, as I, a very simple example where, as I put my fingers on here, um, it's, it's sensing where I'm touching and removing these, and then we're drawing a polygon around them. We're drawing a polygon around them. So, um, so we have an event, a touch event, and the different touch events are, are press, released, moved, or stationary. For example, where stationary comes into play is if I uh, release a finger here, well, I haven't moved the other three fingers. So in that event, when that event gets reported, it still reports that the other three fingers are there, but they were stationary. So those are the four types of events. And then each touch event comes with one or more touch points. And each of those touch points, or each of those touch pens, events has an ID that then identifies it. So when I put three fingers down, or four fingers down, there are actually four touch events happening. And each of those touch events ha have four touch points. Okay. So to respond to those, um, we can say on touch pressed, on touch released, and on touch moved. And then here what we're doing is we're going to take that event and we're going to update the polygon. Update, and then the, here's the method for update polygon. So here's a, a question for you for, um, uh, from a few slides back. If I wanted to, instead of, say, um, use a lambda here, um, if, what else could I use instead of a lambda? From hand, anybody have a hand? Yes. 
Yes. Yes, I could have used those double colons. I could have used a method reference. So here, I could have just said this colon colon update poly, and then the E, the event, would have been, uh, would have been sent to that update poly. So here in the update poly, what we're doing is we're taking the touch event, we're uh, taking this polygon and clearing all the points, and then for every touch point in the touch event, we are going to add those to the polygon. So it's a very simple uh, example, but a very powerful one as well, where, where as I'm touching it, it's iterating over the touch points in the touch event and then building the polygon. And then as I move it or remove things, then it's updating. But that's all the code there is to that. Okay. There's something else called the, pol uh, the pagination control, and it helps you um, create a multi-touch application that where you want to maybe show different pages and scroll through those pages. So here's, uh, here's an example of, the, of using the pagination control. Maybe I want to show some pages. Here I'm just, um, each page is a number. Or maybe I want to go directly to a particular page then this, this whole, everything that's in this scene here, in this window, is the pagination control. And so um, every page in there is a node subclass. So a node could be something very complex or very simple. Um, and then also you can either have numeric page indicators or you can have a bullet style that I just demonstrated, this, these bullets down here. So the code behind that in this very simple example is I'm creating a new pagination control that's part of the JDK library. And I'm saying I want 10 pages and I want you to start on page zero. And I'm saying I want bullets here, so I'm giving it that style class. And then um, there's a method called set page factory. And you pass in then, in this case I'm passing in a lambda expression. So whenever somebody touches or swipes, then it's going to call this with the page number that I'm supposed to render. And then here then, the body of the lambda is the rendering. So here what we're doing is we're creating a text and then we're, we're uh, concatenating a space so that we, um, that we do a, you know, a string concatenation um, to, with the page index plus one. So we're saying, give me a text um, component with the number of the page plus one, because it's zero based. So we want one through 10, even, and, but the page numbers are zero through nine. So then we set the fill color to blue, give it a nice big font, and then we return from that method, we return the node that we want to display when that particular page was passed into us. So that's, that's, that's as simple uh, as it is. Um, so, yeah, Microsoft PowerPoint quit working. Isn't that great? Okay, so um, we, will, we will start it up again. And we'll go down memory lane. Anytime this happens, I always like to go down memory lane with, with the audience here and just kind of reminisce about good times that we've had together. So after I, after I taught you about, you know, developing Java ap ap applications and, you know, buttons and animations and binding and scene builder and how to download it and some features and lambdas and how to simplify lambdas and adding in validation and change listeners and how to use method references. Do you remember those? Those were the good old days, I think. I those are some of my fondest memories with you was when we talked about fun uh, method references. And then I told you about my blog and then we talked about Nashorn, which is a... a which is a, uh, a JavaScript engine on the JVM. Talked about some new JavaFX features in JDK. I told you about Modena, a really awesome style class, and some, uh, some core enhancements with collections and observable arrays and, and um, some binding enhancements, task and service kind of stuff, um, some graphics, full screen, remember that, and unified stage style, and Swing integration and how that can really help you modify, uh, migrate swing either by 
embedding Swing within JavaFX or JavaFX within Swing. We talked about rich text and the text flow, the printing, CSS, and web view enhancements, date picker. What was next after date picker? I forgot. What was it? Tree something. What was it? Tree table. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very good. Um, and then we started to get into this multi-touch stuff. And uh, that brings us back to kind of where we are now with, uh, with accommodating fingers. So um, the idea is that your fingers are larger than the mouse pointer. And so if I have this application where, um, where I'm, I want to use my fingers instead of the mouse, then I want some of the control surfaces to be big enough to where I can manipulate them with my touch. So they're, they're slightly bigger than they are with the normal application. And the way that we do that is we set a, the FX font size in the CSS to a particular font size, and that makes them, uh, that will then make it bigger based upon the, the font size that you put in there. So that makes the controls kind of larger to be able to accommodate that for you. And by the way, this is that for you. And by the way, this is an application where um, that you can download with the JavaFX samples that shows you um, an example for virtually every technique in JavaFX. For example, um, timelines and uh, animations, things like this. And so, for example, if I wanted to know more about fade transitions, then I could, I could see a fade transition or fill transition or, or um, maybe I want to know more about canvas and how to use canvas, um, which is an immediate mode drawing type of thing. I could go look at that example and then I could look at the source code for that example. So it's a really good way of being able to see what capabilities are in JavaFX and then see uh, source code that's that that uh, works with that particular thing. That particular thing. Okay, now I'd like to give you a, a, a brief introduction to uh, Java FX 3D. And um, so Java FX 3D has um, kind of three things with it. Um, three different types of predefined shapes with it. We've got boxes, cylinders, and spheres. And, um, and also you have some user-defined shapes. Obviously not everything is a box, cylinder, or sphere. So you have some three predefined pre shapes. Um, and you, for that you use triangle meshes and a mesh view. So you could have a very complex shape and you would use these, these meshes. So here's a very simple example of of 3D here, where we have a sphere and a box. And we're just kind of rotating them. So this is how you would create that. You first of all create a material that you want to wrap your shape with. And then you set a diffuse color and a specular color in this case. Here's a diffuse color. And a specular color is the shiny parts of the, uh, you know, where the light would shine. And then we're creating a new sphere with the 200 radius, and then we're associating that with the sphere. Uh, uh, we're setting, I'm sorry, we're setting the material and associating it with the sphere, and that's all there is to being able to create a sphere with some material. Um, so you have all sorts of different textures and materials that you can use with JavaFX 3D. For example, uh, here's a diffuse color. But you can have also maps, which are images that you would put on these objects. So here we have a diffuse map that we're putting on this sphere. Also, there's something called a bump map. A bump map um, gives the appearance of bumps on, on a 3D object, but there aren't really bumps on, that, on this sphere. It's just the, the bump map, the image, is giving it kind of that <clears throat> that appearance that there are bumps on it. So that's a bump map texture, but then this particular one is, uh, Duke's nose here, is a um, is just a diffuse map. It doesn't have a bump map on it. But in both cases, they're just images 
that we're, that we're wrapping around the 3D object. So uh, maybe what I want to create, though, is not a box or a sphere or a cylinder. Maybe it's a more complex object. And so um, uh, what we can do then is use uh, textures and kind of use something called UV mapping to map a texture to different types of shapes. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and map this texture to a primitive shape, which is, a, in this case, a sphere. So we have this UV map, which takes an image and slices it up. And, and those slices then are going to be kind of wrapped around that sphere. Now, the reason why they call it a UV map is because in 3D, X, Y, Z were already taken, right? So, um, so the, the, two, the, you know, the horizontal and the vertical are represented by U and V. So that's why they call it a UV map. They, they, they slice up the image into, um, you know, and into you know, U and V. So here we've got a, a, a texture, which is an image, a Mercator projection of the Earth, that we're going to slice up into a UV map, and then we're going to put it on the Earth. So here's an example then where I've got a, a sphere, and I've done just that. We've taken a Mercator projection, and we've put it on that sphere. So the code behind that is here. It's very similar to the, the other sphere that we used, except for in this cape, case, we're associating a diffuse map, an image, with that material. So the image, then, is what gets put onto the sphere. And this code is the same. Um, so there are three kind of concepts that, uh, that are very important in JavaFX 3D that, that are added um, with JavaFX 3D to JavaFX. And one is 3D geometry, which I'm starting to talk about now. But the other two are lights and cameras. So here's a demonstration of lights in JavaFX 3D. Um, so we have this, go ahead and close this window. Okay, so we have these, uh, this, this light here, which is a, a movable light, which is going to kind of move around the scene. And this light is a stationary light, but it's going to use a fill transition to change colors. And then we can see the, and then we're going to go ahead and rotate this cylinder, and then we can see the effect of the, of the lights on the cylinder as the lights are rotating and changing colors and the cylinder is moving. Okay, so that's all happening in real time. So it demonstrates not only the effects of that, of the lighting on the cylinder, but it also demonstrates the idea that you can put lights anywhere in the scene. So you can, you can set up point lights and light up different parts of your scene. Um, they can exist in any X, Y, Z coordinates in the scene. There are, there are two types of lights. One is a point light, but another one is an ambient light. Ambient lights kind of, they don't come for any, any particular point. They just, um, they provide a general lighting to your scene. But point lights are in specific points in the scene. Um, so the code behind that then is I can create a point light, a new instance of a point light, and I give it a color. And then here I'm putting it in an XY position, XYZ position in the scene. And then, um, and then I'm going to add a camera to the scene so that we can view the scene from a particular XYZ location in the scene. So we're saying perspective camera um, equals new perspective camera, and then we are uh, setting the location of the camera to a negative 10 on the z-axis. Uh, positive goes into the screen on the z-axis, negative comes out of the screen. So we're setting the, the, the camera a little bit behind the objects that we see in our scene. And so um, if I had a first-person kind of game like Minecraft or a shooter game or something like that, then I could simply move the perspective camera around 
the object in my scene as the user uh, somehow navigates through there. And then that causes the point of view to, of the user to be where the camera is as I'm moving around. Okay? So there's a, um, there's a nice uh, utility called 3D Viewer, which you can get from, uh, from, the, from the JavaFX samples. And you can see um, it, it has some loaders to where it would load like Maya objects and some other popular formats, uh, 3D objects in popular formats into this viewer so that you can see the effects of that. But also, um, and, you know, more useful is the fact that in your JavaFX applications, you could use external 3D builder, you know, modeling tools and then just bring those in at runtime rather than having to, you know, build all of the objects by hand in your scene. So you, you have those um, possibilities. And then finally, before Mike comes up, I'd like to show you an example that I built uh, for a couple reasons. One is I, I play an eight-string Ibanez guitar, and so I can't always take that on the road with me. So I built for the Windows 8 machine uh, uh, an eight-string guitar. Um, but it also makes a great example for not only multi-touch, but 3D examples. So, um, so, here, so, um, so here's the application. And I'll just uh, demo a little bit, to maybe play it. So I'm just playing it just like a guitar. And, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I won't quit my day job, by the way, but, but yes. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so there are, uh, how many guitar players do we have in here? Or any stringed instrument players? Okay. So you know that there are several techniques in guitar playing that, that we're using here. For example, uh, you know, when we did the slide. I'm sorry, that's a bend or slide, um, and uh, this is called a hammer-on here, where I'm showing, where, I'm, where I have one finger on there, but then I'm hammering on and pulling off. It's, it's, it's important that, that even though I pull off, I'm able to make the string return back to this sound. Now, on a real guitar, when you pull your finger off, you can pluck the string as you're pulling it off. I don't have that option here, but I'm using the, um, the touch events, specifically the stationary touch event, to know that that finger hasn't moved, right? So that I can still go ahead and play that other note, okay? So uh, there are some features up here, then, that use 3D. And, and some other features that use the touch event. Like, for example, if I wanted to change the instrument, then I bring out, I animate out using a translate transition on the z-axis, a, um, a cylinder. And that cylinder has a diffuse map that has the different, um, different musical instruments. So then maybe I want a banjo. You know, that type of thing. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe, uh, let's see, maybe a timpani, I don't know. What movie is that from? <laughs> 2001. Okay, anyway, 2001. Okay, anyway. Okay, so let's see, back to the slides here. Um, so when we, when we, put five fingers, I, I, I pressed five fingers on the display, that's when the picker came out. So we just sensed the, on the touch pressed, if the touch count was five, then we show the MIDI picker. And so in the show MIDI picker method, we're, we've got a translate transition with a duration of two seconds, it took two seconds to come out. And then we set the from to 400, um, which is in the screen 400, 
and then we set it to a z of negative 100, which caused the picker to come out. If I looked, if, actually, if I looked at what's happening behind the scenes here, um, behind the scenes here, um, I've got this mode where I can put it into a 3D mode. We can see that that picker is back here, right? So when I when I do the five finger thing, it's actually just coming out, right? So that's how that's how that's working. And then um, also there's things that that I, I I did in here just to be able to demonstrate some 3D things like like to be able to rotate this to scroll, right? Scroll it this way. Um, rotate, do the rotate gesture thing, do the zoom gesture, and then finally, um, I'm going to bring it down to about 25% of the original, and then it, it'll pop back out, and it'll go ahead and do all the transitions, um, you know, uh, both in scale and in rotation and um, position, and, and come out um, using a timeline uh, to its normal position uh, to its normal position. And so I'll review some of that code really quickly for you here. First of all, rotating the instrument picker, we used a scroll for that, and um, we set the rotate based upon uh, the total delta. Um, playing the strings, the hammer-on, pull-off, slides, things like that, we just used the touch, press, release, moved, and stationary events. Um, the switching modes, when I, the way to, I switched modes was I put four fingers on one particular string, and um, so that's, uh, that was this. I, I put four fingers on a string, and that put it into 3D mode, and then I put three fingers on a string, and that takes it out of it. It's kind of fun. It's, uh, all, this whole guitar is just, is just um, you know, you've got a box with an image, um, you've got uh, these fret markers are cylinders. This, uh, these things are, uh, the strings are actually cylinders. So when I play something, here we'll make it a French horn or something, trombone. But you can see the, you can see the strings uh, vibrate because we're using a, a uh, little transi translate transition to vibrate the strings. Um, uh, but when we hit four fingers on one string, we can use something called belongs to to, to see whether all of those touch events, all the touch points, belong to the same node that the touch event originated in. That's how we can tell it was in the four, uh, the four came on the, were on the same string, this belongs to. And then this, the, ro the, set, the rotation where I um, caused everything to rotate and then kind of pop back out um, and, and uh, go back into this original place was, um, was this timeline here where we've got this timeline. So instead of using a transition like translate transition or rotate transition, I went ahead and used a timeline and then I set up different key values that represent the positions and angles that I want the, um, the guitar to return to. And so that's that. Uh, by the way, under, underneath the covers, um, we're using for the sound part, uh, we use the underlying MIDI, but in between there, there's a layer that's, uh, that's created or that's uh, provided by JFugue, which is a really great library by David Cole that, um, that allows you to kind of do some musical things underneath the covers. So um, I'm going to get into some embedded support things. Actually, Stephen's going to talk about that. That's another feature that's been enhanced with JDK 8. We've got um, uh, JavaFX is going to be in Oracle's implementation of JS, uh, Java SE 8 on x86, x, uh, x64 ARM. Also, embedded SE Embedded 8 is going to be on ARM. Um, and then SE Embedded 8 will have a subset of uh, JavaFX, notably uh, WebView and MediaView won't be there. And then Stephen Chin is going to talk about some JavaFX 8 features on a Raspberry Pi, and he'll be showing that. But before that, uh, I've uh, asked a very special guest, uh, Michael Hoffer, um, who is the author of uh, VPlot and VRL Studio, 
uh, to come. And so he just came up for the day, especially for this, um, when I found out that he um, actually put the first uh, open JFX 8 app into the Mac App Store. And so, Michael, will you come uh, and talk about this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate his app here while he uh, talks about it. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe you have some slides first. What are you going to do? What are you going to talk about, Michael? I'm there? OK. Yes. First of all, you should put the Zen guitar also in the App Store. OK, there it's you go. It's a really nice application. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. thanks. OK, um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the application vplot and uh, VR Old Studio, and also um, uh, about how you can actually build OpenJDK today and OpenJFX. Um, and also then uh, how to just submit uh, an application to the App Store afterwards. So uh, a few words about me. I'm currently doing my PhD at the Goethe Center for Scientific Computi uh, Computing in Frankfurt. And um, I'm developing visual uh, programming concepts um, for complex uh, simulation systems. And that's why I'm interested in JavaFX as uh, UI technology. Um, yeah, then I uh, wrote some applications like VR Old Studio, which is uh, currently a swing-based visual uh, programming IDE. And we are uh, moving over to JavaFX, and that's why I developed some other applications like this vplot I will show you later. And also I've contributed to the uh, JF Extras project, for example. Yeah, so uh, now about vplot. Um, it's... Um, a workflow-based uh, plotting application. A workflow-based uh, plotting application. And here you see a picture of it. Um, it has uh, some uh, internal windows. And before uh, we start with that, I, I'd like to uh, outline a bit uh, how I got started with all that. I mean, um, when I started with JavaFX, I just wanted to uh, draw a rectangle, something like the basic thing. Uh, of an uh, internal window, and um, I just added some dragging code to it and everything like that. And then people were very nice in the community to um, actually point me into the right direction, that I was actually not painting a rectangle, but rather than that, I would uh, add a rectangular node to the scene graph, and JavaFX would do the uh, painting. And so um, this is a very nice thing about the community, and Jim does very uh, good community uh, leading I think it's, I really appreciate it because uh, when I started one year ago, I didn't know, didn't know anything about JavaFX. And uh, actually also, uh, Stephen, even though we just met today, you are one of the reasons uh, why I use JavaFX because uh, you had this petition for open sourcing JavaFX. And I think it's a very important uh, um, idea to have things open. And it's immeasurable value to... Uh, education to be able to dig as deep into the APIs as, as you, you want to do. And that's why I try to um, compile OpenJDK and OpenJFX8 uh, myself. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the motivation behind it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, are we in the, the live app yes. now? Yes. Okay. So, um, maybe uh, you can start connecting the uh, okay. um, 2D plotter and the 2D input node. Maybe drag a couple things around just for the fun of it here, right? And yeah, right. And can it, you explain this behavior? Yeah, yeah what's that behavior? Um, it's kind of cool stuff. Yeah, actually, um, when I uh, um, started uh, creating workflow uh, libraries with uh, JavaFX, then I wanted to be able to scale out so that I can display as much content as I like without using a scroll bus. Because if you just want to have an overview, um, it's very convenient to just see things a bit smaller. And it was very difficult to do in, in Swing uh, mm -hmm. for me. I mean, it took me weeks and uh, even months to get it right. And in JavaFX, it's just like uh, you uh, add a um, transition, uh, um, transformation to it, to the uh, node basically the parent node, mm -hmm. and, and then even the mouse events uh, will be transformed correctly, and in Swing you had to do the mouse event handling yourself for, for scale content. Uh, it only worked for, for the uh, graphics, actually. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a very important feature, and um, as you can see, everything, even 3D nodes, everything will be scaled down and up as, as you like, and uh, this scale content pane is something also that is a part of JF Extras, actually. So you can just put anything you like in there. And if the bounding box gets too big, then it just scales down and up again. 
Okay. So you asked me to go ahead and connect some nodes. Do you want yeah. me to connect this one first? How's, like that one? Okay. Like that. And okay. then uh, you have um, actually the charting API that draws uh, a nice line chart of the uh, function um, you see in the input node. Mm -hmm. And um, you can drag the slider okay. and it uses um, uh, bindings to update uh, the chart. So you see that we can ch change the parameterized uh, uh, function there. And it's very fast and intuitive actually. And uh, what I try to do with that is to explore um, uh, the plotting capabilities and also um, what I liked about it that I don't have to use uh, different libraries for that. So it's, it's really easy to, um, to actually just draw something with a charting API and you don't have to think about what kind of uh, library should I choose, like something like J, um, what's it called? Um, J free chart or something that you could use with Swing. But uh, this is a lot easier and it has nice animations actually and it's nicely integrated into the whole scene graph concept. So you, you could use uh, CSS and stuff like that to, to style it correctly. So that's very powerful. Okay, now what would, you, what would you like me to do? Yeah, then now we connect the input 3D and the plotter uh, 3D. Okay. Um, so now we have a nice visualization and we do the same we did in 2D with uh, just 3D. And you can now uh, actually, um, yeah, you can scale it a bit up, but you can uh, also, uh, rotate and uh, yeah, change the perspective of that. And the really interesting thing here is I don't use a separate camera for the 3D stuff. Usually when you do swing development, you have like a special component that shows some OpenGL content, which is completely unrelated to your uh, uh, scene actually. But uh, the great thing is if you move the window around um, the, the 3D plotter window, then you will see that the lighting will change and also the perspective will slightly change because the camera is just the camera we use for the whole scene. So we don't use an extra camera for free, uh, 3D. So that's kind of the um, interesting thing because it's, it's much better integrated into the uh, scene graph uh, than before. And also what's really great about the uh, 3D uh, nodes is that they share the same 2D API uh, um, like from buttons, you can use the same mouse event listeners and everything um, as you were used uh, to before. And, um, and also um, then you have something called ray picking, which is a very powerful uh, technology to um, actually compute the intersection between uh, the ray pointing from the mouse pointer to the um, uh, geometry. And mm -hmm. if you do a right click somewhere, mm -hmm. So, and then you see that the, this selection uh, um, component, which actually, actually uh, contains some, some uh, LCD controls uh, done by Garrett Grunwald, um, updates uh, the value and it's the exact function value at that point. And what you also see is with uh, the, uh, the animated circle, this again is just a regular 2D shape, but you can position it in a 3D space. And that's also very nice that you can mix 2D and 3D and it was not possible before with uh, OpenGL integration. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really powerful thing. And um, yeah, what I... So what, yeah, what, no, it's, so what it's are fine. We, what are we gonna do here? We yeah, yeah slide this or? exactly, yeah, okay. just, just slide the... So what, so what is that point there? That point is somewhere in, the, in this uh, 3D space that's representing it should uh, be near, okay, it should be near one, actually. You want, me to, get, want yeah. me to try to get a near one there, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it actually, it doesn't matter, but uh, if, okay. if you... Okay, that's yeah, near, yeah, is that, that near enough close, one? That's close, yeah. Okay. And then if you change it, then also the value will, will be updated, and we use bindings for that as well. Okay. So that works very nicely. Okay. So, so that works very nicely. Okay. So uh, that's basically um, the application. Um, uh, I will extend it later on, but uh, first I, I wanted to um, kind of uh, create a um, uh, first demo app that I could deploy to the App Store to see how things are going and also to check the, the quality of OpenJDK 8 and OpenJFX 8, and I'm really pleased with it. So now, just a few words about VRL Studio, because this is um, 
uh, where we want to um, go in the future. And we did this in Swing. It's part of my uh, PhD thesis. It is a visual programming environment that uses uh, a reflection and uh, groovy scripting so that you can go combine visual programming, text-based programming, and it's uh, very uh, useful for teaching and for creating simulation workflows. Uh, uh, so it's also a new approach because you, uh, you don't restart processes there, like in the regular IDE where you just write your code and then you run a, a different JVM and then run the application. Rather than that, you, we are running in, in just one uh, um, uh, process and updating it while it's running. So, and here you see a few examples. We have some plotting capabilities uh, um, and also sound generation and stuff like that online and even OpenCL integration. So you can do groovy programming and integrate OpenCL for, for powerful computation. And um, the basic idea is here you see a source code representation and um, if you compile that source code, it just contains something like Hello World. Um, it will automatically generate a component which represents the, the instance you create after compiling the source code, and then you can interact with it graphically. And um, maybe we just uh, go to the next example. Okay. Yeah, this, oh, this, this is a, a very powerful one. Here you see that we can create um, a, a color chooser, for example, with uh, just 10 lines of code or so. And the interesting thing is that you actually do not uh, have to um, uh, write your UI code uh, yourself. And that keeps uh, things separate because if you um, teach students, for example, and they start uh, discovering that Java has really rich APIs for UI also, and it's very easy to integrate UI into algorithms, then, um, then they mix it usually. So they write a very nice algorithm, then they mix it with UI stuff, and you usually shouldn't do that. And VRL Studio keeps things separate. And also, when we move to JavaFX, you can just reuse the same source code you, um, you see here um, in a JavaFX application. So we are working on that, and if you're interested in in, in that kind of technology, then just check out the project. Um, we saw um, the, the web page earlier, and uh, it's completely open source and, and free to use, and you are also free to contribute also uh, into, uh, you can contribute to the 3D plotting that we do in JavaFX and also workflow management and so on. Yeah, so now um, open JDK 8. You've seen a lot of features, uh, uh, what, what will come with uh, Java 8 and, and, and JavaFX 8. Um, people ask me questions about, yeah, is it really um, useful today because Java will be released in March 2014? Um, and yeah, the cool thing is that we have a complete Java 8 version already. We have OpenJDK, we have uh, OpenJFX, and they are fully capable. You can use them today. And um, I just tried, um, after Java 1, when I heard that uh, even the media thing was uh, released so that we had kind of a complete open JFX, um, even with uh, media support. And um, I was really surprised how well everything worked. I mean, uh, it's a very huge project. And with just a few lines of code, you can compile a whole uh, JDK yourself. And the cool thing is you can re release it today. I mean, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't use all that nice Lambda stuff you, you saw earlier and, and all the nice uh, graphics enhancement uh, for, uh, for applications today. Just check that the use cases you have work correctly and then um, you can, yeah, you're ready to deploy, yeah. Okay, then when building uh, OpenJDK, um, uh, I created a uh, small application called JSelect, where you can select uh, the JDK you want to use in a terminal window. It works on, on Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows, so it's, it's easier for, for you to uh, actually um, uh, switch the path uh, variables and so on. So this is kind of difficult if you do it manually and you do it wrong sometimes. Um, in this case, um, yeah, I think we can switch. Uh, what we do here, just let me see a bit closer. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. So that's what you basically do to uh, compile OpenJDK 8. You choose a uh, Java 7 um, 
uh, JDK as Bootstrap JDK, and then you basically configure it, and you say that you want to uh, um, uh, set the debug uh, mode to release because you, you're creating a, in release mode, you're not testing in this case. Then you can uh, specify some milestone variables and also um, the location to the uh, Bootstrap JDK. Just in case it doesn't find it, you can specify it in the in the configure uh, uh, call. And then uh, there's one thing um, when you follow the the documentation um, on uh, the OpenJDK pages, um, they they say that you should install the correct uh, Xcode version. But in many cases, you install Xcode in different versions, and that's why it's good to. Uh, to check that uh, the correct one is, is actually installed and you can do this uh, uh, Xcode select uh, command and then you can switch it to uh, Xcode 4 which is the one that's currently required. And then um, after that um, you might uh, want to force Xcode to reinstall the command line interface because um, sometimes they, they have uh, kind of a mixed state so it doesn't work well. You just give it a clean install and um, uh, you can also force uh, um, uh, the package uh, utility to forget the command line installation and just do it again if it thinks it has installed already. Yeah, th that's it for that slide. So um, now we are going to compile OpenJFX. So we have now a complete OpenJDK 8 uh, um, uh, which is bundled because we have this uh, make um, images um, command and then we select this as uh, our JDK we would like to uh, use for compiling uh, OpenJFX and you see here we have an, an 1.80 uh, internal uh, version so we can go to the next slide and here you see um, uh, yeah, Gradle uh, properties. Um, it's very important to uh, define the uh, macOS SDK there also if you have uh, multiple versions of Xcode installed. And uh, we see it here that you use uh, the uh, macOS 10.7 uh, SDK so you're compatible with uh, actually 10.7. Um, and then in the uh, build properties we set uh, the binary step. We, uh, we need a, uh, um, a JFX RT char. Um, just uh, um, for, for building source code, which is automatically done. And then we can uh, specify the version and numbers. And uh, it's very important to specify the, the minimum version number um, so uh, um, the OpenJFX won't uh, complain that we, um, we actually used uh, an unsupported uh, JDK. That's at least uh, one problem I had. Okay. So submitting to the App Store is actually um, is uh, a bit difficult, a lot more difficult than actually building the whole JDK uh, and millions of lines of code, actually. Um, what you have to uh, do is first you have to do uh, uh, sign uh, the um, JDK and your application bundle that you build with a nice uh, native bundling. Uh, we have in um, in uh, JavaFX, mm -hmm. so yeah, signing it. Um, you have uh, this code sign command where you can uh, um, specify um, the certificates you got from Apple, and then you specify the application bundle. And what you also have to do is to specify an entitlement for for sandboxing because you are only allowed to to deploy uh, sandboxed applications to, to the App Store. And maybe you even have to do that for the uh, bundled uh, JDK that you ship with your uh, application. And, and sometimes you even have to do it for, for, um, for executables uh, that are part of the JDK, but the, this command will give you some error messages on that. And also, um, I will create a detailed tutorial on, on how to do that, and we can even maybe simplify uh, things uh, even more, because I think it's important to use OpenJDK. Mm. Uh, um, this will make the project stronger, and uh, it will gain acceptance, 
and, and all that. So it's, it's completely valid to have this uh, binary distribution from Oracle, but I also think it's important to keep the open source version alive and then building it yourself. Yes. And it will also uh, be very useful for education because I, for example, use it also at university f um, to really dig deep into the APIs, check how did they do that, how do they do the event handling and all that, and you get it for free and it's completely open. So um, it's, it's a huge value. Yeah. Cool. Okay, then, um, yeah, uh, go, go back once. Um, sorry. And uh, we were not finished here. Oh, sorry. Um, we have to create um, actually a, uh, a package file for the App Store. And there is this uh, product build command where we specify um, another uh, certificate again um, so that we can assign the, 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 the package, the final package that we are going to upload. And then we have another command for for testing the installation, you can basically install it uh, um, the way the, the App Store would do before you submit the app. And then you use um, the um, uh, application loader, which is part of Xcode, to just upload the application to Apple, and then they run some automatic testing frameworks to, to check whether you use uh, valid APIs and all that. And I was very surprised that basically um, JDK, even the open source version, does all that correctly, so they, they accept it. So um, there are a few things. Um, we can go to the next one, yeah. Um, the most important thing is you have to be careful with uh, the description. If you say something like, I created a very nice and cool open JFX 8 demo, they will say no. <laughs> it just won't work. And then I said, okay, I said something <laughs> like, um, uh, this app demonstrates uh, um, a new user interface approach for VRL Studio, something like that. And they say, no, this is a trial version, at least it, it sounds like, and we, we, we don't even try that. So I had this description in the application, and then I removed it there, and also the, the app store description was something like that, and they still deleted the, the whole bundle and said no, uh, submit it again, and I had to do over and over again. This is uh, why it took me so long. And then uh, there's another thing, menu names. Um, they are very picky about menu names because if you create uh, an application, then on the Mac you have this kind of quit, and then it automatically uh, puts in the, the application name there. And uh, usually uh, JavaFX um, does put there the, the, the main class in there, and so you have to come around that and put in the, the correct application name. And they even try it. I mean, there are really humans who try your applications and they send you screenshots and say, no, you can't do it that way. And there's also another problem I had with um, uh, JavaFX actually has a very uh, good application framework. You saw it earlier that you extend an application class, which also uh, checks that um, it only closes when the last stage closes, for example, and you can change that behavior. But it took a while, actually, because they probably do some kind of garbage collection before closing, I don't know. And um, it took them too long. They said, no, the window stays open even if I, um, the application stays open, open even if I close the window, so we won't accept it. And then I just added uh, an, an handler uh, to the close event and said just uh, system exit zero mm -hmm. to, to kill the thing. And then they were fine with it. Mm -hmm. And after changing everything, uh, it, I could upload. And I think um, doing, uh, this kind of distribution um, is very good also for small companies. If you have a nice idea, just create a uh, JavaFX application, and you're independent of the release cycle, uh, um, because uh, I don't want to want to wait for, for Java 8 uh, for the official release, because if I write source code now, um, I don't have the time to just write it over and over again to actually be able to use lambdas. And, and, and lambdas, for example, are very important, uh, not only from a syntactic point of view, but also um, it is very important to allow library developers to optimize code because you have this um, whole new way of thinking about where actually the, the, uh, the logic for parallelization should be. Now we are able to put that into libraries and not have it 
um, in the user code where the user decides whether uh, we are using a for loop, for example, to loop over elements. And then it's not so easy to actually uh, use a parallel version of that. You have to create threads yourself or use fork join or something like that. But it's very easy if you just provide something like for each, and we have that in collections now, and, and for doing scientific work, uh, I see a lot of benefit from, from our uh, computational point of view. And, and also um, uh, the, the JVM doesn't need to create uh, class files just for your uh, inner classes. And sometimes you do that even automatically in, in threads and so on, and then you get lots of class files that are essentially unnecessary. So that's why I want to use Java 8 today, and also the, the stream API, for example. And um, yeah, basically I couldn't have published these uh, applications um, if I didn't have uh, JavaFX 8 because 3D was not in there as it is now in, in, in JavaFX, so I couldn't use uh, JavaFX 2. And also, uh, as VRL Studio is implemented uh, in the Swing, I can now just take out components there and put it uh, uh, into a node in, in the scene graph, and it's totally powerful because I can reuse my, my text editors I have. I, I don't have to um, rewrite them, and it would take me probably a year to, to do all the work over again, and, and I don't have to do it, so. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for, for, for doing this, for putting that in the App Store, and for yeah. providing um, an example of how to do that, how to get one into the App Store, how to build the OpenJDK and for the tutorial that you said you're going to create. I, yeah, I'm going to create we're, we're it, looking, and we're looking if you're forward to seeing that. interested, just uh, you see the link here. I'll put up some materials, and yeah, we keep in touch. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Uh, so we're going to take a 15-minute break, um, and then Steve's going to set up his Raspberry Pi and that kind of thing, and so we'll get together at 11.40, and then Steve will uh, go for the next 50 minutes and and uh, um, and uh, demonstrate Apple or Raspberry Pi and Lambdas.